Euh, merci euh, d'être euh, avec nous cette, pour cette dernière après-midi de notre euh, conférence sur le, le catch A. Donc, euh, nos deux euh, participants cet après-midi euh, nous viennent d'Angleterre et du Canada et présenteront, comme vous en doutez et comme cela apparaît sur le programme, en anglais. Donc, je vais euh, diriger cette, euh, cette session en anglais. So, um, our two speakers uh, today are mostly interested in performance studies. Claire Warden, our uh, first speaker this afternoon, is a lecturer, our maître de conférence, in drama at the University of Lincoln in the UK. Her research focuses predominantly on marginal modernist performance and has been included in journals such as Modern Drama and uh, Theatre Notebook. She wrote a book, her first book was published last year, uh, uh, and it's entitled British Avant-Garde Theatre, and was published last year by Paul Grave. She has a particular interest in the relationship between politics and theatre, uh, specifically in the interplay of power within the performance space, and her paper today comes from this inquiry coupled with its uh, an ongoing fan interest in professional wrestling. Yeah. So Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start today with a caveat, which is that I'm going to be predominantly thinking about the WWE today, um, not because I'm ignoring indie wrestling and other promotions, but because um, my inquiry, I think, relates more easily to independent wrestling than actually it does the WWE with all its financial clout and its um, kind of um, implications, I guess, in um, hegemonic capitalist structures. So I suppose what, really what I ended up thinking about was whether my suggestion about democratic space, which is what I'm going to be talking about, relates to the WWE franchise at all. So I suppose that's sort of where it comes from. So if it feels I'm a little um, marginal in my understanding of wrestling, then um, you're right at this stage. I want to start with just two stories which um, sort of exemplify, I guess, what I'm going to be talking about. And the first one was from um, November uh, 2011. I was at a, a live recording of WWE's Raw show in Liverpool. Um, and a, a fan held up a sign which had on it Anonymous Raw GM? Question mark. And this went back to a storyline that had been set up by the WWE um, a few weeks, months previously, where there had this been, this been kind of uh, a disembodied general manager um, who could only speak through a computer. And then suddenly the storyline disappeared entirely. And so this sign was drawing attention to something that the WWE had seemingly forgotten or chosen to, forgotten, to forget in some way. And um, this was ignored soundly by um, commentators, um, but was picked up by um, the podcast, which um, if you're a wrestling fan, and, and you'll know some of the podcasts I'm talking about, um, who kind of nodded to its wit in many ways. And as a performance scholar by trade, it got me thinking again about the role of the audience, and particularly the role of what I'm going to term, well, what, what are term smarks, which I'm not sure is a word that, we, we had a chat about this last night, but whether it would be a word that would, um, is applicable in a French context. But it's basically the combination of Mark, somebody who kind of knows what's going on and wants to know about what's going on, and smart. So kind of perhaps potentially more intelligent or more knowledgeable, um, or at least claiming to be a more knowledgeable um, watcher of um, wrestling. And those are the people that I'm kind of interested in today. Um, so another story. Fast forward to two weeks ago. Um, you have um, the heel, the current heel, um, CM Punk, and the returning hero, The Rock. Um, Punk's shoot promo, um, again, throw words I use that seem a little out of context. Please feel free to question me on them at the end. Um, or perhaps even mock shoot promo, which is what I kind of suggest it is. Um, berated the fans for their unquenchable desire for entertainment. The Rock's response was, here in the WWE universe, there's no such thing as the voiceless. And again, this pointed to the role of the audience, and this time as orchestrated by the WWE scriptwriters. Um, again, there were more questions for me. Um, are a wrestling audience voiceless? Does it have a voice? And if so, what sort of voice is it? Um, I have this paper in French as well, um, which is translated. I don't know how good it is. So if that would be easier for you, then um, I'll pass it around. Yeah, so I, so the, I'm going to sort of read the paper so that it, it corresponds with this. So forgive me if I break off occasionally. It most of it will be read. Um, OK. Yeah, please read it. Just if it's useful to anyone. <laughs> I'm not sure if it is. You probably are. Um, all fine, but if it's useful to you. 
Um, so Roland Barthes um, claims wrestling as a spectacle of excess, and many critics follow his lead in using the lexicon of performance and theatre. Influenced by the ideas of Mikhail Bakhtin in his Rabelais and his world, cultural critic John Fisk, for example, claims wrestling as a carnivalesque spectacle, a performance of the grotesque rather than a sport in any traditional sense. In her book, Professional Wrestling, Sport and Spectacle, Sharon Mazer too reads wrestling as a morality play, ballet, folk drama, vaudeville, and even as an example of Artaud's theatre of cruelty. Um, I, I'd really be very glad to question those theatrical models. Actually, we were talking about this earlier on, um, because actually I'm not sure that any of them work particularly brilliantly, and so it would be maybe something we could talk about at the end. The accusation of artificiality discussed by most of the academic responses to modern wrestling suggests a compelling need to justify the merits of professional wrestling as a sport and or as a field of study. Reading wrestling as performance from the off immediately extricates the form from these allegations and freeing it for new interpretations and analyses, which is kind of where I'm coming at it today. So in this paper, I'm aiming to identify the changing relationship between the wrestling stage and the spectators or as I term them in the um, title, actors and audience, so I'm aware of the fact that those terms, again, are problematic in, in the way that we use them. Again, something perhaps we can bash through. Um, in this, I do not presume homogeneity. Wrestling audiences contain a range of different types, all responding to the spectacle in their own ways. Over the years, the audience for this type of wrestling has changed quite considerably, from the working-class Irish exiles at the carnival to the John Cena t-shirt wearing multimedia savvy children of the 21st century, which sort of chimes what Dan said this morning. Um, in fact, this assumption of homogeneity has caused real problems in wrestling companies. It could be argued, and in retrospect has probably been proven, that WWE owner Vince McMahon's rival promoters underestimated an audience that was far more sophisticated than it was given credit for. While attempts will always be made to manipulate the emotional response of the audience, it's the viewer or consumer, again, those words, difficult words um, to use in this context, um, who ultimately decide how they want to respond. And this chimes with John Fisk's conclusions, and I quote, popular culture always is part of power relations. It always bears traces of the constant struggle between domination and subordination, between power and various forms of resistance to it or evasions of it, between military strategy and guerrilla tactics. This continual battle becomes particularly troublesome and fascinating when we turn to the WWE business machine, a promotion that stands apart from other wrestling companies simply because of its financial clout. At first glance, the relationship between the actors and audience may seem straightforward. Um, adept at manipulating the crowd, the wrestlers on behalf of Vince and the board, who kind of have the shadowy feeling across the whole thing, um, lead the dumb spectators by the nose. Actually, um, even in a, in a promotion that initially seems to have complete economic and communicative control, the relationship between the actor and the audience resonates with tensions and complexities, the audience playing a participatory role in shaping the performance. And this is sort of my, my central claim, really, as we go through. Um, the burgeoning reality television genre, particularly in the last two decades, caused the WWE to emphasise audience, particularly through its pay-per-view uh, event Taboo Tuesday from 2004, later renamed Cyber Sunday, and more recently, the X Factor style Tough Enough. However, this and other attempts to emulate reality television's You Call the Shots mindset um, have met with rather lukewarm response. Um, it's frequently dream, uh, deemed derivative um, or half-hearted, and actually, I don't know if you've been watching this a bit, all these recent Twitter polls where it's, everything's done by Twitter. Um, it even feels kind of loaded. It feels like everything's decided beforehand and yet you have to send a tweet anyways. Okay, So th these are uh, sort of been roundly criticised, I, I think. Um, unlike these experiments in the reality genre promoting a passive audience, moments in WWE history clearly reinforced the power of the spectator. These moments, of which there are a number, interrupted the well-oiled WWE machine inadvertently transferring power from the promoters to the audience in interesting ways. Um, I'm going to th I think of two matches by way of um, demonstration, although there are many, I'm sure that you're already hoping, hopefully anyways, you're already starting to think of some. Um, but these are two from um, the flagship event, WrestleMania 2002-2004. Um, and in both cases, the performers were forced to adapt their performance and though I'll, I'll question whether they were adapting, whether they preempted it, it's again it's an interesting question, um, in order to meet an, uh, the expressed preference and indeed expectations of the live crowd. 
So 2002's um, WrestleMania 18 saw modern day hero The Rock face off against uh, recently returned veteran Hulk Hogan. A protracted run up to the event initially saw Hogan attempt to resurrect the contemptuous egotistical persona he had used successfully in a stint in WCW, the rival promotion at that time. Um, his turn from long-term hero to villain is considered one of the most shocking and, in retrospect, well-delivered moments in the history of professional wrestling. Following a near two-year hiatus from television, however, and a near decade-long break from the WWE, the audience rejected Hogan as a heel. And despite increasingly desperate attempts by WWE writers to emphasise his cowardliness, cowardliness is normally a defining characteristic of, of a heel, um, he, 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 like, he did things like um, driving a semi-truck into an ambulance which is supposed to contain rock. All these things that went on, this sort of sense of cowardliness that you would associate with heel. Even though they did that, actually, the audience seemed unable, or certainly unwilling, to respond to Hogan's heel persona. And so to the match itself. Um, the Rock was the most popular breakout star to emerge from the WWE in recent times. And a career as a film star was about to take off in a more successful way, ironically, than any before him, including Hollywood um, Hogan, whose heelish persona involved in making these outlandish claims about what a great movie star he was. And subsequently, the WWE had no desire to significantly weaken or undermine the heroic standing of a man that they hoped would, through success as an action star, act as a global promotional tool for the business which had made him. And therefore, in the weeks before the event, while some concessions were made regarding Hogan's character, um, things like um, um, he asked his rival stablemates not to intervene in the match. So you, you saw a kind of slight non-heelish, like maybe slightly kind of face turn in some ways. Um, but The Rock still remained the clear face positioned against the heel Hogan. And through the course of the match, however, an overwhelming fan reaction in the Toronto Sky Dome left attempts to maintain these persona redundant. Um, his regular offensive moves leading to howls of derision rather than the normal cheers, The Rock began to engage with the audience, first in visually betraying and um, expressing his shock, which Hogan mirrored. He, you know, Sort of rocks. If you look, I actually rewatched this again last night, and um, it's, it's really interesting that they kind of mirror each other's actions um, in this match quite a lot. Um, and then he sh showed anger at what he termed to be the fans' betrayal of him. Um, eventually, he began to adopt the heelish tactics of his opponent, um, delivering multiple knife edge chops. And for, so, if you know what I mean, um, yeah, fine. <laughs> this is knife edge chop. Um, and even going as far as to illegally whip Hogan with his own weightlifter's belt. Actually, if you, if you watch it, Hogan had tried to like, win whipping Rock with the belt, and Rock kind of looks at it and struggles with his own sense of faceness, and, and yet uses it anyways. Um, even in the era of the anti-hero, um, a role that Rock had not firmly adapted at the time anyway, and this was the behaviour of a villain. Um, Hogan, in turn, largely began to re-adopt the fan favourite persona, mm encouraging the cheers with poses, um, his typical poses, all this sort of stuff, um, and challenging Johnson to listen to the fans. In effect, the audience demanded a match take a particular route, and the wrestlers performed the roles in response. The predetermined outcome of the match, a hard-fought rock victory, became virtually inconsequential. Hogan received a rapturous ovation, confirmed as a fan favourite once again, and emphasising the changes that had taken place during the contest, it fell to Hogan to raise the arm of his victorious opponent, um, hence re-establishing The Rock's face credentials. The, I, I watched the end of this match last night, it's actually quite interesting, because The Rock kind of goes around the ring doing his normal when he stands at the edge of the ring and does his move like this, um, and, and goes to Hogan in the end, and Hogan offers his hand to him, and Rock is unsure whether this is part of you know, his heelish turn, and he's going to grab him by the hand. And, but actually, they shake hands, and Hogan lifts the hand up as a sort of signifying, saying, well, I'm passing this on to you. I, I, accept you as, as our face, basically. At the end of this match, then, the WWE, or at least the performers themselves, attempted to regain control by responding directly to the audience's demands. If the events surrounding the Rock Hogan match demonstrate the ability of the audience to directly influence what is performed, and vis-a-vis -vis that of the players to modify their performance uh, to meet those expectations, then those of 2004's WrestleMania 20, and specifically the match between Brock Lesnar and Bill Goldberg, illustrate how spectators can and will reject the official story outright should it not meet with their approval. As one of the headlining events of the pay-per-view, the Lesnar-Goldberg match was again a strongly promoted clash, which <coughs> built over a number of weeks, the former losing his championship to a rival following in illegal interference from the latter. Actually, Stone Cold Steve Austin gave him a ticket to the events, and so 
you know, I'm going to mention Stone Cold in a minute, so that's probably quite important that he's actually implicated um, in the storyline already. Um, both performers, athletes with illustrious amateur sporting backgrounds, eschewed the conventional heel face identities of professional wrestling. They had similar appearances and builds and dominant monster personae. While this meant fans eagerly awaited the matchup, those attending WrestleMania 20, however, did so knowing that both men, for both men, this was likely to be their last professional wrestling match, uh, perhaps forever. This was unrecognised by WWE programming, but um, there, there were these rumours flying around that both were leaving at the end of this match, um, that um, Goldberg's contract was ending, um, and that Lesnar wanted to go into American football instead. Um, so while WWE didn't recognise this, many in the audience, smarks as mm. are their term, actually knew what was going on. Um, and this was part of this burgeoning online wrestling community, which I'll return to at the end. Um, so the grudge between Goldberg and Lesnar, as promoted in WWE programming, leading up to WrestleMania 20, was not considered legitimate by any but a small section of largely very young fans. Um, such a question of who will win, of course, it's worth recognising, holds as much interest to a fan asking who will the writers put over as it does to the naive fan asking who will win the legitimate sporting contest. Neither performer, however, um, expected the response to the Madison Square Garden crowd. In fact, if you listen to the commentary of this, um, it's uh, um, uh, uh, Jerry the King Lawler, and he, they have no idea of how quite to respond to this. And they pinpoint the fact that the audience are criticising them, but it, this, it, this, it seems to change constantly through the match of how, how you might draw attention to that or not um, as, you, as you listen to it. Um, so, so the visible, as visible agitation of both their match was met with not boos and cheers, but slow hand clapping and chants of you sold out and goodbye. When the contest came to the conclusion, in order to meet the demands of the audience, it fell to special guest referee and wrestling veteran Stone Cold Steve Austin, him again, to administer deciding blows to both victor and loser, affirming the audience bestowed humiliation, we go back to this notion of humiliation we were thinking about earlier, um, and delivering to the fans a satisfying outcome. It's almost impossible to comprehend this taking place, certainly in any other live performance medium. Um, yet there's another tragedy aspect of this event. While never confirmed by the WWE, it's generally accepted that Vince McMahon's son Shane was in the crowd, joining in with the chants. Um, so does this mean that the WWE management orchestrated this audience response? She, is Shane merely an audience member? Um, was he only... Oh, goodness, right. Um, was he only reacting to the general atmosphere around him? These are questions we sort of leave hanging. So what unites these two diverse moments? Um, well, first, there are incongruities between the story the WWE wanted to devise and the story they were compelled to present due to the audience's response. Um, in both, the relationship between fictional storytelling and factual actuality became confused. Um, the focus on the film careers of The Rock and The Hulk, the actual contractual issues um, of Lesnar and Goldberg. I suggest that the most memorable moments in WWE history, for the Smarks at least, um, traverse this troublesome line between imagination and real. Um, and in both the audience forced resolution, um, though whether the WWE behemoth reacted to, choreographed, or simply exploited the situation remains a really contentious issue. Whichever, the WWE often boasts of Raw as the longest running serial program on American television. It's just, mm, extremely long, um, yet it would certainly be true to suggest that soap operas that we might compare this to have an entirely different actor-audience relationship. Um, so rather than reveal the image of the wrestling fan as a duped ignorant fool, um, these two examples sometime, um, reveal the sometimes profound influence that the audience can have over the performance. Um, not only because the WWE by necessity pandered to audience demands for ratings, but also because this performance experience is inherently reciprocal. Despite the almost hegemonic power of the WWE, this discursive reciprocity can at times be unmanageable. Um, and while not wishing to overstate the point, professional wrestling, even the WWE, can in this sense at least be seen as a democratic forum. Um, I'm going to come on to the, the conclusion, but I, I might leave out a little bit um, just because of the, the time. Um, so I should perhaps mention in conclusion that this paper comes out of a far broader project on wrestling and mediation. Um, there are many aspects of this I haven't had a chance to mention. Um, so the most important, of course, is that we many view wrestling through screens, which is something that sometimes we forget. Most of us, most of us take in our, our wrestling experience each week um, through television or through... Um, so which gives a kind of very different sort of viewing experience to live, live performance, live stage performance. Um, I'm also really fascinated by silence in wrestling, which is something that I'd like to work on a little bit. Um, in in theatre, silence is a requirement. 
in, in the wrestling arena, it's the worst thing ever. Mm. Um, so it's a second really only chance of boring, though even then I think maybe silence is worse, actually. Um, so I'd, and I'd also like to think a little bit more about the use of placards as well and, and, how, and how that works with wrestling mediation. So clearly the smart and performer enjoy an active, transformative relationship, um, whether in the moneyed arenas of the WWE um, or among the smaller communities of the backyard. Um, and I sort of go on to sort of suggest that this relationship received a new impetus during the 1980s with the dirt sheets, these, um, kind of these uh, newsletters really, um, uh, written in people's bedrooms. Um, and these guys who are writing these, these newsletters are now the, the top guys in the sort of internet gurus of wrestling, like Dave Meltzer and Wade Keller and these sorts of people. Um, so again, it's sort of a new way of interacting um, with, with wrestling. And what, what I find particularly interesting about this is that they, um, they often treat the matches as a theatrical performances. Um, so there's a star rating, one, two, one, three, five star. Um, and that star rating is not based on the, the conclusion of the match. Of course, it's based on process. And, it's ba and you lose marks for things like um, being able to see air between in moves. Um, it's not necessarily all about the move set, it's also about the storyline and the narrative that's created as well. Um, of course, to suggest that all fans, I'll, I'll go on to the end, to suggest that all fans engage with wrestling to the same critical extent would be wrong. Even as the rise of the internet has allowed the bedroom newsletter editors of the 1980s to be, to be the professional web entrepreneurs of the 21st century, with ever inc increasing global readerships and paying subscribers, importantly. For every fan who watches an episode of Raw on one screen while reading the real-time live updated analysis from Wade Keller on another, many more will tune in simply to see if their favourite wrestler is going to win, or if a wrong protagonist from the previous episode is going to exact his or her revenge. Nonetheless, the internet wrestling community, the IWC, um, has emerged as an individual classification in its own right, which the wrestling industry has identified, um, unsurprisingly given its 18 to 30 adult male demographic, um, which is often considered to be um, very prominent and important in the entertainment industry, um, as something for priority. Um, as I come to the end, I, I just want to briefly kind of connect the two papers, maybe preempting Broderick's little. Um, so if Bro Broderick's paper um, focuses on the performing body alongside notions of liberation, freedom and work, it would appear that mine attempts to readdress the way these performers are perceived by spectators. Um, and more than this, to re-examine the reciprocal relationship between the two sides of the porous prosanium divide, using the word prosanium just to suggest again that, that notion of the theatrical. If wrestling democratises the body, freeing it from conventional movements to perform spectacular, unimaginable feats, then there is always the latent potential of an empowered audience response. In spite of the dictatorial systems defining the WWE promotion, ingrained as it is um, in, the hegemonic, in hegemonic capitalist constructs, as with all dictatorships, moments of rebellion, revolt, or insurrection always simmer beneath the choreographed pyro and hustle loyalty and respect taglines. <laughs>